All right. Well, again, if you want to review these exams, just feel free to stop by my office and we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, your next homework assignment, hmm, here they are. Uh, it's also posted on MU Online, the PDF of it, but I'll give you a paper copy. You've got some time for this one. It's not due till Tuesday, October 24th. So is that two weeks? Two weeks. Wow, man, I'm really going easy on you guys. i got to dream up some new ways to challenge you. But uh, what we're going to be talking about today is um, taking a step back and just some conceptual ideas related to um, runoff hydrographs. And the whole point of teaching you some of these fundamentals was so that you can have an idea of like what's reasonable and not rely on the output of numerical models without understanding you know, whether the model is doing something realistic or something ridiculous. Too many people take engineering software, just punch in the numbers, and then never even give it kind of a, a sanity check. But having an understanding of the fundamentals of hydrology will allow you to, to spot when a simulation software has kind of gone off the rails and giving you an unrealistic answer. And so we're kind of moving from the background science part of the course finally now into application and uh, simulation. So this is going to be one of those transition lectures that kind of uh, illuminates where we're headed from here. And uh, in a large-scale hydrologic model, what we want to kind of understand is the water. You know, where is it coming from? Where is it going? What are the quantities? And uh, so if you think about a basin, and this is a, just an image that I took from a previous slide to remind you, you know, you have a ridge line that's defining the, uh, the boundaries of a watershed. And in a large-scale hydrologic model, we want to know what's the flow rate coming out of that watershed. So here, Q out would be the stream discharge from a watershed. And if that's the main thing you want to know, the flow going through a culvert or under a bridge or the flow that's available uh, for industries to use for things like cooling or irrigation or agricultural use, you, know, you want to be able to predict this excess water. Uh, here are some of the main factors that have to be considered. And the first, Q in, is talking about if there's any water coming from a watershed upstream. So surface flow or um, water flowing from a river. And in this case, there aren't any upstream rivers. You can see that it's completely encapsulated by, um, by a ridge line. But there are cases where you may have a watershed with a larger river upstream of it that's flowing through. And so, of course, Knowing the flow from upstream watersheds is one part of it. Uh, the precipitation is going to be coming in from above, falling on the ground surface. And evapotranspiration, there's a mi minus sign there because it's going to be not adding to the amount of water that is available to flow out of the watershed. The evapotranspiration decreases the amounts that, you know, all only the flow in and the precipitation are, are sort of the plus values there. Um, groundwater recharge, we usually think of it as uh, going down into the ground and leading towards base flow, which gets into the streams. But there are cases where groundwater recharge could be a positive value in a watershed. If, for example, we have a physical ridge line here, but what if there was infiltration on the right side of this ridge line that then seeped into the watershed underneath the soil boundary. So there are cases where groundwater recharge could be positive, but in most cases groundwater recharge is decreasing from the amount of precipitation that leads to runoff. And that's what we were talking about in the previous classes was just that uh, you know, precipitation minus infiltration is the ponding. Uh, storage could be a res surface reservoir. So surface water storage. We don't have a lot of uh, surface reservoirs here in West Virginia, a few, but the water levels can go up or down over time. And in a lot of cases, those can be controlled with dams that um, we have control over the, the water depth and the flow rates coming out. And so that's also a case that can be a plus or a minus. Uh, 
Large quantity users may be um, like uh, mining operations that are doing hydraulic fracture. They use quite a bit of water in order to, to fracture gas wells. Uh, they can be um, electricity production plants that are using water for cooling. Um, uh, it, it could be water bottling plants, depending on the size of the watershed and the amount of water that's being used. You know, a large quantity user usually has to be something industrial rather than just you know, someone's home well that's extracting water from the groundwater. And then finally, the agricultural water that's being used. And in places like Northern California, uh, out in West, agricultural users are a huge part. And in fact, the agricultural use may be so big that there is no flow out of a watershed. You know, the Colorado River, which used to make its way to the Pacific Ocean, now it never does. It just sort of is used by all of the people along the way, uh, mostly for agricultural uses. And uh, it never makes its way to the sea like it used to. So this is just kind of a conceptual idea of where the water is coming from, where it's going, and what we want to do is create a, a balance so that we can know over time um, how much is in each of these categories. Evapotranspiration is maybe the most difficult to model because it, um, there are so many factors that uh, change over time to increase and decrease the evapotranspiration. Um, so we'll go through some terminology that's important to understand. And one of the first ideas is the idea of abstraction. And sometimes we use the word precipitation when really what we mean is rainfall excess. Um, because it's not necessarily precipitation that leads to runoff, um, but it's the amount of precipitation that is above and beyond the water that's required for surface wetting and the amount of water that's delayed. Um, and so if you can see in this image here, we've got a puddle on some pavers or wet asphalt. So if there's rainfall, even onto an impervious surface like uh, marble pavers or asphalt, you know, we think of these as not allowing, water, not allowing water to penetrate down into the ground. But you may remember that the C value for asphalt, I think in the exam, what, what was it, 0.86 was the C value that we used for asphalt. And so it's not because asphalt is a little bit porous, and during a short duration storm, water is going to be going down underground. But the C value is 0.86 because a fraction of the water is going to be used to wet the surface. And it's an irregular surface with a lot of, um, a lot of surface area to it. And in fact, let's just go back to that, uh, that C value table. I'm going to pause the recording here so I don't accident. All right, so here is the C value table for an asphalt surface. And what you'll notice is that the C value is increasing as the return period goes up. And that's a direct reflection of the idea of initial abstraction, which is what we're talking about. So what it says is, then in a two-year storm, um, more of the rainfall is going to be used just to wet the surface compared to in a 100-year storm. In a 100-year storm, there's so much water that only 5% of it is wetting the surface of the concrete. But in a two-year storm, it looks like 27% of the water is abstracted. So we can use that as a verb. It means delayed or somehow lost, and the water is, uh, is not available for runoff. So it's not that the surface itself has changed its characteristics depending on what the storm is, but it's just um, here kind of trying to recognize that when you've got a lot more water, that that abstraction is going to be a smaller fraction of the, of the sum. All right, so this can delay the, uh, the time that it takes for the water to get to the outlet because when the rain starts falling, there has to be some puddle accumulated before there's sideways motion over the surface. And it also reduces the quantities. So those are both good things. We like abstraction. If we're trying to decrease the peak flows, then if there's some way for us to maximize abstraction, then let's, let's do it. You know? If we can make concrete more rough instead of smooth, not only does that improve traction, but then it also may uh, improve the abstraction. Um, 
So being able to quantify these abstractions when it comes to design is going to uh, affect how big the pipes need to be to convey peak storms. It may affect the uh, sizing of ponds, and it's going to adjust what kind of treatment process what we have to do. And treatment processes for stormwater are usually pretty simple. It may just be settling out uh, sand or grit, um, uh, trying to remove oils. But if you have water that's going to be flowing over a, a dirty street surface, then that water is going to be polluted. And you'd like to do some sort of at least rudimentary pretreatment before the storm water goes straight into a creek. So that's abstraction. And uh, we're going to be coming back to that idea quite a lot. And we'll sometimes talk about how a surface abstracts the water. And it's the difference between observed precipitation and rainfall excess. Rainfall excess is precipitation minus abstraction. All right, so interception that we're interested in isn't the football kind of interception, but rather it's how uh, water is sometimes coming into contact with things before it hits the ground. It may be plant surfaces, it can be buildings, power lines, um, any sort of uh, thing that's up in the air that's going to interfere with the water's path down to the ground. And sometimes it can be a pretty substantial fraction of the overall rainfall. Um, here is a table that says the percent of water that can be intercepted depending on different types of trees and grasses. So there are some conifer trees that can intercept 48% of a storm. And this is an annual average. And of course, you know, this percent interception is, uh, this, this column isn't telling us how big the storm is, because if it was like Houston, Texas, 20 inches of rain, this tree is not going to take 48 percent of, you know, hurricane strength precipitation. Um, so I guess we'd need to dig into each, each of these references and see what was the storm size that they were talking about. But I guess what this is saying is over an, an, an annual average. And so if you're talking about you know, most of the storms we get in a year are less than a one-year storm. So those tiny little storms that maybe are you know, three-tenths of an inch or half an inch in an afternoon, then maybe it would take 48% of one of those. But if you go down the scale to just things that are on the ground, you know, like this, the um, forest litter, um, it may only just be 2% of the flow that's intercepted. I'm actually gathering some data right now related to interception to try and find out um, how the specific trees that we have in this part of West Virginia uh, affect uh, interception. And so what I've got is some rain gauges that are in an open area, some rain gauges that are under trees uh, out in the woods, and um, they've been running, those rain gauges have been running for about nine months now, just gathering data. and. What I do is I compare the, not only the amount of water that's different between the rain gauge under the tree and the rain gauge out in an open area, but also what I'm mainly interested in is the delay in time. Because you know if you've ever stood under a tree that you stand under a tree at the beginning of a storm and it's perfectly dry. And you, you know, you're safe and sound for maybe five or six minutes, but then you know, a few drops start coming through. And, and so there's a little bit of a delay there that is really important in um, understanding how to quantify that so you can predict uh, flash floods. We have such steep watersheds in West Virginia that flash flooding is a problem. One of the things that is the biggest, accounts for the biggest delay in time between when it starts to rain and when the flood comes through is the interception from a tree. And if you think about uh, where um, hillsides have been deforested for like mountaintop removal, and when they take away all of that interception, then all of a sudden the flash floods can come through a lot more quickly. So a lot of the flooding that we see in southern West Virginia um, could be partly responsible to changes in uh, vegetative cover because not only is it going to be less infiltration when you disturb the soil, but also now you've got less interception. And so 
the delay is kind of, you've lost your delay effect. Okay, so um, now how much interception, like we've just said, it's going to vary by storm. And the smaller the storm, the better the tree is going to be at intercepting a greater fraction of the flow. Um, climate has a part to play. And we'll look at an equation in a minute where we model uh, interception. And one of the factors that goes into that model of interception is the humidity and evapotranspiration. Uh, vegetation density, so if if there is a blight going through the trees in the area where they're, they're not leafing out as heavily as they normally would, or you know, in the fall when the leaves start to come off of the trees, then the vegetation density is lower, uh, age, size, and health of the plants. So here's that equation that I was telling you about. And uh, it's a logarithmic function that says there's some base amount of storage that you can expect from different types of trees. And then this accounts for how big the storm is relative to that base storage here. So here P is the amount of rainfall. And so what this model tries to do is uh, account for the fact that in a big storm that the storage is going to be overwhelmed and that there's going to be less interception than in a smaller storm. Now the secondary term here uh, is trying to account for evaporation during the storm. And even though relative humidity is, rel is, is higher in the storm than during other periods, there still is going to be some, uh, if we go back to the picture of that leaf, there is going to be some water that's lost. Uh, and if it's spread out in really thin layers, then that can increase the amount of evaporation. So it's not insignificant, and that's why it's included in the model here. So just to get it a, uh, a try for a feel for how this works, let's say that we have a storm that's 1.5 hours long with 3.8 centimeters of precipitation and that there's an evaporation rate during the storm of 0.3 millimeters per hour. So I'd like you to try and get your hands dirty with this formula. Let's see uh, how much precipitation is available for runoff and infiltration. So it's going to be precipitation minus the interception will be what this is asking for. So here, the storm duration is 1.5 hours. The precipitation amount during that period is uh, 38 millimeters. And uh, the evaporation rate, 0.3 millimeters per hour. We can look up from the table the leaf area index. Oh, wait, was that given? Leaf area index? Oh, yeah, so it was given. Uh, in your homework, I think that uh, the leaf area index is not given. Actually, that's the unknown that you have to calculate. So it's just a matter of solving for that value. All right, so um, we get that the uh, amount of interception is going to be partly due to the storage onto the tree surface. That's the first term. And the second term is how much evaporation occurred from the tree during the storm. And so those two components together are 9.89 millimeters. And so if during that storm there's 38 millimeters of precipitation and 9.89 is kind of held by the tree or evaporated back out into the air from the tree, then that means there's only going to be 28.1 millimeters of rainfall excess. So that's the water that's available for runoff and infiltration. So actually, Rainfall excess would be this amount minus the infiltration. So this is just, this water is going to go to two places, down into the ground or over the surface. But 28.1 is how much is actually going to get to the ground because the rest of it was stuck on the tree or evaporated back out into the air. So I mean, it's not the most complicated math, but um, what I like about this example is it kind of helps you to 
understand and appreciate where the water is coming from and where it's going. There is the precipitation, the evaporation, the wetting of the tree, and then the leftover balance is either going to go into, uh, into the ground as infiltration or over the surface as runoff. Any questions about that one? <laughs> yeah, this is a long receipt, huh? I only bought one thing. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so here are some other abstractions, things that delay the water and decrease the amount that's going to occur as runoff. Uh, depression storage. <laughs> depression. You guys look like a bunch of depressed students. All glum. All right. You're graduating soon. You're young. You should be excited and enthusiastic. All right. Maybe you're graduating? Okay. Yeah. Um, so some of the water doesn't immediately infiltrate or runoff. Basically, we're talking about puddles. So one of the things you learned about in hydrology today was puddles. Uh, and now, an irregular surface is going to have more uh, surface depressions before it's been disturbed. But you know, if you have a mechanical soil grader going over an area, there are going to be fewer of these depression storage areas. And so then the water is going to move more quickly over the surface than if you have just sort of the natural variations in elevation that occur when you've got some soils that are settling. and some locations that maybe are swelling if it's clay soils. Um, so this is just another case of how you think about urbanization and human development changes the natural topography and how that increases the qu how quickly the water arrives at an outlet location. You know, uh, humans have to have regular surfaces for things like construction and crops. And so anytime you uh, take the variation and make a surface more homogeneous, then that's going to increase the speed at which the water flows over it. So you get rid of puddles, and the water moves more quickly through a watershed. All right. Here's a picture of a 747 landing on a wet runway. And the point here is just that the, even the water on a, a paved surface can be a pretty significant fraction of the, of the, the abstraction. And um, <clears throat> the more flat a slope is, the more depression storage there will be on a paved surface. And so you can see here that for steep pavement, you could only maybe have half a millimeter of depression storage as compared to flat surface, where you may have up to 3.5 millimeters of water, depending on uh, how porous the pavement is. Uh, forest litter has a really high depression storage as compared to impervious areas or lawns that are cut more uh, close, less of the water is just going to be you know, stuck by gravity to the surface itself. Um, the specific surface area is what we were talking about before when I showed you the picture of that asphalt and how uh, it seems like it's kind of uh, has a a lot of porosity and uh, has a, a high surface area relative to its plan view area. And the water affinity of some materials, uh, you know, like a, a highly polished surface or um, sloped roofs that are made out of like vinyl or metal roofs are going to uh, have less of a depression storage than, say, like an asphalt roof. Like I'm sure you've seen the asphalt shingles that are sometimes used on roofs. And then the uh, antecedent moisture condition, you know, like if it has recently rained, if it was rainy yesterday and the roads are still kind of wet from that, then uh, as soon as it rains, then you may have uh, overland flow. And, and so you have to think about not just the, the surface, but also um, like in the storm in question, what the conditions before your event were. That's called antecedent moisture content, AMC. All right, stream response is what we're going to be talking about next. Stream response is basically uh, how the depth 
or how the flow rate in a stream changes once there is a rainfall event. And what we want to do at the macro level is have a hydrograph and turn it into a hydrograph. And you know that a hydrograph is just a representation of these periods of time in which a certain rainfall intensity occurred. And so we want to be able to translate rainfall data into runoff data. And part of the reason why we're interested to do that is to make sure that there's enough water available for irrigation and drinking. Uh, this is the inlet to uh, um, a, a city's treatment plant. You know, they're taking water from a stream and so you have to have some minimum amount of water there in order to uh, satisfy the demands for it. But water isn't always a resource. It's sometimes a nuisance and a, a risk factor. And so being able to know the response of a stream to rainfall allows you to uh, forecast what flooding conditions are going to be like. And it's kind of amazing sometimes when, if, if you've ever watched the news when they're talking about flooding, they'll predict hours in advance what time the river's going to crest at and, you know, what the depth will be. And it sometimes seems like magic that they're able to say, well, no, actually, we're, you know, Huntington doesn't need to put its flood walls in because the river's going to crest at 38 feet or something like that. And it's, it's not magic. It's because they know what the rainfall was upstream. They have models that predict the response to rainfall events. Um, and these also, uh, these events can affect the water quality because there's a lot of sediment that gets washed into the stream. And I'm sure if you drive by the river, I drive by it twice a day, so I keep a pretty close eye on it. And there are times that it looks kind of like a chocolate brown, and then there are times when it looks like a less chocolate brown. <laughs> It's never crystal clear, let's be honest, but uh, sometimes it looks a lot more turbid than others. And the reason for that is that when you have really heavy rainfall, it's washing the sediment uh, into the river. And so that can have big effects in what a treatment plant has to do in order to get clean water into Huntington. And there are times during the year where the treatment plant has to, um, they have to use activated carbon in order to remove organic materials. In the spring, particularly when farmers are applying pesticides and fertilizers, that can, if it rains too soon after they've applied pesticides and fertilizers, it can wash into the river and then um, they have to put something in that will absorb those organic pollutants, so like activated carbon. Um, so the water quality changes a lot when you have uh, a storm, it, especially if, if you've got a combined sewer like we do in Huntington. If the sewer gets full, then there are times when they'll discharge untreated sewage into the river because they just don't have enough capacity at the plant. And they call those um, combined sewer overflow. And that can have a big effect on the water quality because then you're not just talking about organic pollutants, but you're talking about microbial pollutants that can you know, uh, really cause a lot of trouble for human health oh, in the short term. I mean, the uh, pesticides and fertilizer, that will kill you in the long run, but you know, E. coli could get you in the short term. All right, so here's a graphical representation of what we want to be able to do. And uh, I'm going to teach you how to do it eventually using a program called WMS. And in the shorter term, we're going to be using kind of like some, have you ever heard the phrase back of the, envel back of the envelope calculations? It's like if you only had 10 minutes to come up with a quick answer, there are some shortcut ways to go from a rainfall hydrograph and turn it into a hydrograph. Um, probably the most famous shortcut way uh, is Q equals CIA. You know, that's a way of taking rainfall data, in our case we're just assuming a constant intensity of a storm, and turning it into runoff. But the rational method is just only predicting peak runoff, and so it'll tell you what's the maximum flow rate but sometimes we want to know what the entire curve to look like. Uh, maybe because we're sizing a pond, and you can't size a pond when you only know the peak runoff. You have to turn that into some sort of a hydrograph. So having an accurate stream flow hydrograph is what we're really after. There are factors that can adjust um, the delay. So if you look at the center, the amount of time, you know, it looks like this storm kind of peaks out at about 18 and a half hours. And here, the peak of the discharge is also at about 18 and a half hours. And so just looking at that, 
my first impression is that this stream is really responsive to the storm. There's not much of a delay between when it was raining and when we saw the peak. So we're measuring the flow pretty close to where the water was falling. It's not like we're measuring the flow rate miles and miles downstream where there's some sort of a travel delay that has to be accounted for. In this case, it's very responsive. There are different geographic factors that can flatten a peak out or that can shift a peak further to the right through delay. And so we're going to talk about these factors. And, um, and I hope you'll take good notes and remember these because these are like uh, prime quiz concept questions as we move forward through the next few slides. Um, so for one thing, um, the, uh, the factors that influence the response could be the, the characteristics of precipitation. So the storm itself, if it's one of those Seattle-type storms, the coastal storms that are just a drizzle all day long, then you're not going to expect to see quite as pronounced a peak flow as the type 2 storms where you have a very sharp period of high intensity like we have here in the central United States. So precipitation characteristics and then also the watershed characteristics. And some of the watershed characteristics that we're going to talk about, for example, is the flow network in the path. So here, this is showing that the rain is coming down from above, and then the water just goes in a straight line over the surface until it reaches a channel. And so here, the water that's flowing over the surface isn't encountering many obstacles, uh, the little small Shallow depth streams are not dendritic, meaning it's not like a circuitous indirect network. It's just a bunch of straight line paths. And so that would be relatively quick for the water to go over the surface in that way. Uh, here is like a uh, conceptual representation of as the water flows over the surface, it's going to become shallow concentrated flow. And the reason why this is getting wider and wider is because you've got more water as you get closer to the stream and because there's more contributing area. And so at the beginning, the reason why this is relatively narrow is that there isn't much upstream area that water is flowing over, but then this small shallow depth stream is getting wider because there's more of the area that's contributing to it. And the same thing is true for this stream. You can see at this point there's just one of these shallow streams that's contributing to it. But now here it's wider because now we've got this one and this one contributing. So it's gradually getting deeper and deeper. So these lateral inflows are increasing the volume of water through the stream over time. So where we measure the stream response um, is going to have an, act, uh, an effect on what the hydrograph looks like. You know, the more upstream area you have, the uh, there could be some significant time delays in how long it takes for the water to get from point to point. Here's some figures that uh, in the textbook, it, the geography and the rock characteristics of an area have a big role to play in what the uh, stream networks look like. And sometimes you can look down on a map and see what kind of flow patterns there are. And around here, I think that most of our watersheds are dendritic, where there's just an irregular shape of the stream. And that's because there is pretty much uniform erosion. And so it's a random pattern. But in the case of some of these others, like the, the trellis pattern, uh, what that means is that there's an unequal resistance to erosion, like the maybe uh, the fault patterns, or um, there may be a, a rocky ridge line that goes across the top here. And so that there would be more scour, e more easily scourable soils going in one direction than another. Um, if there are fractured fault lines, then the, the water may flow in a rectangular pattern where it, it's not quite random. It looks like maybe there are typical directions that the water is flowing at certain angles to each other. So each one of these shapes has effects to how quickly the water flows through the network. Um, there is, I don't think you'll have a homework question related to this necessarily, but there's a, 
a pattern to ordering streams. And remember that there's a nested hierarchy of streams within a watershed. And the less upstream area that contributes to a stream, the smaller the flow is going to be through it. So here, a one, a first order stream, just means that there's actually no channelized flow upstream of it. It means all of the water that comes into a first order stream is just, uh, it's water that's flowing as a sheet over a surface to get, to get to that first location where you could actually take a ruler and measure the depth of it. Now a second order stream is where two first order streams come together. A third order stream is where two second order streams come together and so on. So uh, it's just a way of understanding how often a certain stream maybe would run dry and um, what its typical hydrograph response might look like. There's also some definitions for ordering streams in terms of over the course of a year, how much of the time they have water in them. Um, a perennial stream always has water in it. And the reason why it always has water in it isn't necessarily that the location always is raining, but it is um, maybe low enough in elevation that there's base flow contributing. So that, that's groundwater that's emerging at the surface and is contributing to flow through a perennial stream. You know, in inter intermittent and ephemeral streams are in locations that it doesn't have rain all the time, but also, in addition to not having surface runoff all the time, they may only have occasional base flow where there's water coming from underneath the ground to contributing to them. Uh, so here's a picture of a perennial stream. This is the Provo River in Utah. It's kind of like a famous uh, trout fishing stream. Uh, here's an intermittent stream showing that, you know, that obviously this is a, a really well-defined channel and they get significant flows at certain points during the year, but it hasn't got any flow right now. And then finally, an ephemeral stream, which uh, is not a well-defined channel, and it only really has flow in it when there's a, a significant and defined rainfall event, and then within a few hours of that rainfall event ending, then that ephemeral stream would be dry again. You notice that there's a lot of scour along the banks of the ephemeral stream. It's because it doesn't really reach a good equilibrium if there's only flow going through there um, like a, a few hours every year. It's just there will be a big um, pulse of water through there that causes some scour and then the rest of the year maybe the plants are growing over it and the soil slumps and so on. Okay, so here we're looking at, a, at the same watershed at two different times. Uh, this is a stream network and a watershed during a dry period and during a wet period. And what you'll notice is that the black, the heavy black line during the dry period doesn't extend very deep into the watershed. But during the wet period, that heavy black line, which represents where there's actually a stream, where there's water that's pooling together and flowing in a channel, it extends deeper into the watershed simply because um, you know, when there's more water to go around, then, then uh, the stream extends deeper into the watershed, partly because of the areas of seepage. Um, seepage is the return flow from infiltrated water that was at the surface, but then it comes back out. Um, I'll show you a cross-sectional view in just a moment of that return flow, the interception that comes back into a stream. Uh, the important thing just to, to recognize is that in dry periods versus wet periods, uh, the stream networks where, where they're located may look a little bit different. Now, here is a, a series of successively, successively smaller watershed areas. Um, so think about if, I'm, I'm sorry, not successively smaller. This is the smallest one to begin with. So, Here's a watershed where you can see uh, in our hydrograph there are these rainfall pulses and the hydrograph is very responsive to that. You know, the peaks don't blend together. The peaks are very distinctive. We've got this pulse of rain and you see this peak because of the pulse. And then there's this period of intense rainfall. 
and then this peak resulted because of that. And so we can really point to different rainfall elements to what it did to the hydrograph. And this is because it's a relatively small watershed, a drainage area of 0.2 square miles for this watershed. So it's just this tiny little section of an overall watershed is what we're modeling. And this happens to be a watershed that's in central Illinois. Now, if we expand our area of analysis to 3.2 square miles, what happens is that now the peaks are kind of uh, blending together. You'll notice that the overall amount is higher during the storms, and so the, the peak flow that we see is maybe uh, 0.3, uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.03 is the stream discharge depth, whereas here it was just 0.1. So it's not that there's less rainfall when you have a bigger drainage area. There, there's more runoff. It's just that because in a large watershed, as the water flows through the, uh, as it flows through the network, like there was the first pulse of rainfall, and the water is flowing through here, and it's only part of the way down, and now there's a second pulse of rainfall. So some of the rain from the, full, the first burst of rainfall is in the stream at this location when some of the next rain is getting into the stream from that second period. And so the peaks are kind of blending together because it takes time for the water to travel through the network. And so in this next, uh, in this next hydrograph, what's happening is that this peak is blending together with the second one. The first peak and the second peak are blending together because of the travel time. And that trend becomes even more pronounced as you look at a larger drainage area, 16.6 .6 square miles. Now at this point, you can't really even see any, anything distinctive at all, just because although there were individual peaks, they're kind of mudded together as the, as the water flows towards some outlet of interest. So that's one of the important trends, is that flow through the stream network attenuates the peak it makes it less distinctive, although the amount may be larger, um, the individual elements of a peak are less obvious. Now if we have this whole 43 square mile drainage area, then the peak becomes even more muted. Any questions about this trend? All right. Uh, now, uh, overland flow, uh, Hortonian overland flow is when you have saturation from above. In this Hortonian overland flow, what, what we're looking at is that the infiltration rate is less than the precipitation rate. And so there's too much water at the surface, there's ponding that's getting into the stream. So ponding this cross-hatched water, you see it's a free surface. That ponding at the surface is getting into the stream. Now contrast that to saturation overland flow. That's when the water from underneath the soil is contributing to the flow. So what happens is we're having infiltration, and that brings the water table up. And then when the water table gets high enough, then it comes out at the water sur it, it comes out at the ground surface. And so it's not that there was direct ponding at the surface, it, this, that there was pooling underground. And so what, what you need to be able to understand is the difference between the saturation overflow, where this water that's at the surface right here was just moments ago underground. Whereas in the case of Hortonian overland flow, this was never underground. This ponding was always at the surface, and it got to the stream from the surface whereas this return flow in the case of saturation is only temporarily at the surface and previously was infiltrated groundwater. Okay, so be able to describe the difference between Hortonian and saturation overland flow and a sketch would do a lot to explain it. Um, now here are some terms that I've used a little bit today already, the, the idea of base flow. Um, base flow is there getting into the stream even during dry weather. It's groundwater that gets into the channel 
and we just finally had some rain here in West Virginia over the last couple of days, but the creeks were low, but they weren't completely dry, even though it hadn't rained in maybe more than a month. And that's because in the case of base flow, there's groundwater that's seeping into the channel. Now, in the case of return flow, though, return flow is uh, infiltrated water that was recently precipitation that raised the water table, and now the saturation overland flow is what we're going to classify as return flow. So distinguishing between return flow and base flow, the base flow is groundwater, the return flow is recently infiltrated water. And that's maybe kind of like a splitting hairs definition, because they're both groundwater. Infiltrated water is groundwater. It's just, it's, uh, it, it wasn't underground for very long. It's in the short term, the return flow, whereas base flow is long term. Of course, we've already talked about how overland flow is, it was saturated the surface. The Hortonian overland flow saturated the surface and didn't contribute to the return flow. Okay, so this is the last figure for today. Um, if we look at a hydrograph, then we can break down where the water is coming from. And if there is, this is a discharge versus time. So we're, we have a stream monitoring, and we want to find out how much water is going through a stream. If there's water there even before the storm event starts, then that's obviously the base flow. And then when this rising limb happens and suddenly the peak flow starts to be a lot higher, that's the saturated overland flow because it's just coming over the surface. And water travels over the surface more quickly than the water that has to get down underground and then um, emerge. So let's go back to this figure. So the water that's just emerging prior to going into the stream, this return flow, the saturation overland flow, is going to happen later. It's going to take more time than the Hortonian overland flow did. So what this figure is showing is that the Hortonian overland flow is going to get there first, and then you have interflow or the return flow that's coming from uh, emerging prior to just having been recently infiltrated. And then the base flow at the end of a storm is a little bit higher than it was before a storm, just because the water tables are elevated because of the rainfall that occurred. So sometimes when we're doing uh, stormwater modeling, we'll subtract out the base flow. And what we'll only be predicting is the overland flow and the interflow. OK, so that's all I have for you today. The handout that I gave you with the homework, remember that that's not due until October 24th. But you could solve problem one already. You know, that's related to the example we worked in class today. And actually, now looking at it, you could do question two, too because that's all about uh, abstractions. So my suggestion, get one and two out of the way, and then when we get together on Thursday, we'll start talking about unit hydrographs. Have a good day.